How's everybody doing this morning? Come on. Yeah. It's good to see y'all. It's good to be here this morning. Sorry, I'm just a little bit fired up. You know, I'm just a little bit excited because this kind of stuff really just excites me. And it should really encourage you as, as, as you lean in, if, if you really consider United Church your home, that, that we even consider doing stuff like this. Because this church is not about me. My last name is not United. My first name is not United. My last name is not Church. This is God's house. This is God's church. And we're responsible. We're responsible to connect, respect, and grow. Come on. We are. We are. Connect, connect with God first, connect with other people, respect the word of God, respect the boundaries that he's giving us in his grace that he gives to us so we could live life to the fullest. And then the ability to go with confidence and, and get things done, amen? And, and, and be bold in our faith, the same way we're bold at work, the same way we're bold with our bowling team, the same way we're bold at, at Call of Duty. Real bold when you got a team of nine guys. When, when it's one on one, it's different. When it's one on one, we want you to be able to look at a giant and say, Excuse me, I have purpose. Because David wasn't on the way to fight a giant, he was on the way to deliver ham and cheese sandwiches. And a giant got in his way. See, when you're going in the power that God gives, everybody else has to. So Daniel and I, we, we've been hanging out together now for a few years, um, about two years. He's been here. Dan, Dan, Daniel has grown up in the ministry. His parents, pastors from the Carolinas. And just this solid, solid young guy. Do you have a picture of, of him? I thought I sent him a picture. That I, maybe I didn't send it in. Maybe we'll get it by next service. But it is a terrible, embarrassing Maybe I shouldn't show it. Um, but I, I just love his heart, and he is a servant of the house. He's a son of this house. I trust him. Um, his heart is just, you, you, know when, you know when somebody's really been moved by God because despite their natural character or, or that, that Adam seed, come on, we're in the book of Romans, right, that Adam thing that would want to come out. He's a big guy. He, he can do a lot of things. He's just he's so gentle and he's so peaceful and he, he just loves the Lord and when he's wrong he wants to know he's wrong and he wants to be better come on somebody how many people find that nowadays right you speak to somebody that's that's uh, under the age of 30 and they've known everything for the last 45 years you're like you weren't even born I know okay. but a humble heart just ready just ready to lean in so I've asked him to preach this morning so would you do me this favor? Would you do this for me? And then I'm going to ask you what you could do for, the, for me. Just, just focus. Just lean in. Because he has a good word. The, the book, of, the book of, was it Timothy where it says, no, don't, don't, don't worry about his age. Don't worry about his age. He's been given a good word. That's the Martino paraphrase. He's been given a good word, so he has. But secondly is God, God, God in, in seasons like this, in moments like this really examines our heart and sees like what we're ready to receive, how we're ready to receive. And I learned that a long time ago. Well, the music's not good here. This isn't good here. I don't like it. It's not about my preference. It's not about me. If it was about me, then I didn't need church. Then I didn't need God. Then I could go out and try to deal with my own problems like I've been. How's that gotten me? You know what I'm saying? This is about God and God so, come on, man. Lord, uh, we pray over Daniel. We thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity. I speak, Lord God, just clarity. I speak as he steps forward this morning, Lord God, that you would um, just give him a, a closer look at all the things, Lord God, that's been stirring in his heart, Lord God, the direction that you want him to go now. Lord God, he's putting you first. He's looking towards you, Lord God. He's, he's making you the authority in his life. What a joy, what a blessing, Lord God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would continue to guide his steps. Speak through him this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Amen. Love you. Amen. 
All right. Good morning, church. Um, it truly is a blessing to be able to be up here today. And first off, I'd like to thank Pastor Adam and Pastor Leslie, because I know just through their faith and just their obedience, I've grown a lot. And I've just gone through a lot, and they've always been there. Pastor Adam has been an amazing pastor, friend, and mentor to me. And we know all Pastor Leslie does. She's just always oh, wow. around here working. And so I just want to give them a thanks before I get started. So as you know, we are in the book of Romans. Oh, yeah. Look how that works. Uh, united in the gospel. And so today I'm going to be reading from Romans Six. I'm going to try to get through as many verses as I can, so please stick with me. And so we've been studying this book of Romans, and P.A. has really been encouraging us to read along with him. I finally caught up last night, so we're all good to go. Um, and so we have been reading through it with him, and I just love this because I've not read through Romans since I first came to know Christ. It's just one of those books that is just full of truth and just gives us our foundation for our beliefs and core, um, core beliefs in our faith. And so we've discussed uh, God's wrath, and we've moved, also talked a lot about justification. Just a reminder, justification is an act of God whereby he pronounces a sinner to be righteous because of that sinner's faith in Christ. And so today, as we move into Romans 6, we're going to be moving more into sanctification. And so sanctification is the process by which Christians are set apart for God from the rest of the world, or the process by which Christians are made holy. And this is done through our obedience to God's word and all that he calls us to do. Or you can think of it as being spiritually mature or growing in the Lord. And so today as I speak, I'm going to be talking a lot about death, sin, and slavery. And you'll (laughs) see, I know great things. I'm also going to be talking about life and grace and just, you know, also the other amazing things. But my goal isn't just to tell you that as Christians, as believers, that you have died to sin but allows God, God's word to pierce your hearts so that you for yourself know that you have died to sin and to allow the love of Christ to compel us to run from sin. Because when entering into a relationship with Christ, we start to, what, love the things he loves? We desire, his desires become our desires, but on the flip side, we are also called to hate the things he hate, hate the things that he hates, and he hates sin, and so should we. So we should also hate sin. Because it can be so easy for us to hate this person or that person or this thing or that thing. But when it comes to the enemy, it's kind of like, yeah, I don't really like him that much. But we are called to hate him and the things that he does to this world. And so we've been given the playbook to win. Like, this is the playbook. We've been given the playbook not only for us but him. So we know his plans. We know his tactics. We know who he is. And so let's walk in it. And so by the end of this message, I want you to hate what sin does and has done to you your families, and ultimately this world. Just look around this world, what sin is doing to this world. But to see the love of Christ through it all. And so, first and foremost, I do not want anyone walking out here, just a disclaimer, walking out of here thinking that they are sinless. Hopefully you sin less, but you're not sinless. (laughs) I know, dad jokes, okay. Okay, Uh, but you're not sinless. So I don't want you thinking, oh, I'm free from sin. Daniel told me that I will never sin again. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we will be free from the power that sin has over us. And so we can read this in 1 John 1, verses 8 and 10, where it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I want everyone to have the truth in them. Uh, Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, does not sound good, and his word is not in us. And so I don't want anyone to call him a liar. I don't want anyone to be deceived. I want everyone to have the truth. And so... I want everyone to be on the same page, so I'm going to give a small description of what sin is. Sin has been described as a burden, a stain, and or a debt. And when we think about sin, many people say it's like missing the mark. Uh, It's trespasses, you know, passing a boundary. But more than anything, sin is what we say, do, or think that goes against God's perfect will and who he is or his nature. So when God says do not not lie, he's not just saying don't lie because you're hurting another person or deceiving another person. He says, don't lie because God is truth. And when he says, do not murder, he's not just saying, you know, you're taking a life. But God says, do not murder because he is life. And so these are the things that we do that go against who God is. And so what does sin do? Sin creates a wedge. It separates us from God. And that's why we have Christ. He closes that wedge. And so sin, more than anything, is a temporary satisfaction. You have to go back again and again and again and again. It will never satisfy you. I can say this boldly as much as Christ will. Sin will never satisfy you as much as Christ. And so I'm going to start off 
um, and read. Hold, let me pray first, actually. Um, Lord, I uh, just thank you for this time, God. I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, that to be used, God. And I just ask that you speak through me and touch everyone here, that they may take something from this, Father God. And so I just love you and adore you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Okay. So if anyone can turn to Romans 6. I'm going to just read through the first seven verses real quick so that no one, so we're all on the same page. So uh, I'm going to wait for a minute to everyone get there. We're all there? All right, perfect. Romans 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin." And so as we see, Romans 6 starts off with a question. Why does it start off with a question? Well, first, we have to understand that this is a letter. So it was not broken up into verses and chapters until very much later on. And so let's take a step back to see why Paul asks this question. And so in Romans 5, verses 20 through 21, it says, The law was brought in so that trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that, just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I just love how in verse 20 where it talks about where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Because it goes to show that we serve a God of more and when it comes to our sin and his grace, he doesn't match it, but he exceeds it. And so this is where Paul's question stems from. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? This is Romans 6.1. And so, Paul here, first and foremost, when he says, shall we continue in sin, he's talking about habitual sin, living a life of sin, sin that has become normalized in our lives, the sins that we tolerate. And so, this is the sin that he's talking about. And for Christians, as Christians, please hear me, sin, habitual sin, should not feel natural, because we are no longer the people that we were. Um, I heard this um, example kind of talking about caterpillars. They eventually turn into butterflies. Well, <laughs> yes way they turn into butterflies and so when you see if you were to see a butterfly crawling on the ground you're like that's no longer your nature you're to fly yeah. but if you are no longer a caterpillar you are now a butterfly and so the same is with us we should not go back to what was natural but walk in bless you to what is now natural and so we should not get comfortable in our sin and so Paul hits us Paul hits on this idea because he knows some people might be thinking, well, if, you know, God's grace increases all the more while I sin, what's the harm of me sinning? You know, I can just continue to go on to sin. Or in simpler terms, he doesn't want people to think that sin doesn't matter. So if you choose to live a life of sin, we don't understand the seriousness of sin. Thankfully, in God's word, he explains it to us. So we're going to read Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3. And it says, In you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, and when she once walked according to the courses of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, who is Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by, ch by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And so this is what it means to live in sin. First and foremost, you're dead. And that's something that the Lord showed me before I came to know Christ. He's like, Daniel, you're living, you're breathing, you're walking around, but, man, you're spiritually dead. That's why you feel this void. That's why you feel like you're just going through this endless cycle and nothing is changing because you're spiritually dead. And so how does Paul answer this question? Romans 6, verse 2, he says, certainly not. And so Paul shuts down this idea real quick. He's like, certainly not. You shall not continue in sin so that God's grace may abound to you. And so, Because he doesn't want people to take anything that he's saying out of context. He doesn't want people to say, well, Paul said, you know, we're sinning, increase grace, increase all the more, so I'm just going to continue to sin. He's like, no, certainly not. 
But when Paul says this, it's not just a simple no, I don't recommend that. In the Greek, it actually translates to may it never be, or more commonly translated to God forbid. So in essence, um, Paul is saying, God forbid that you choose to live a life of sin, that God's grace may abound to you, or you may receive more of his grace. And so why does he say this? We can see the second part of verse 2 where it says, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And I truly believe that Paul could not grasp the idea of a believer continuing to live in sin. And so Paul lets us know that once we've come into relationship with Christ, once we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior, we are dead to our old lives. We are dead to our past, and we are told to move on and no longer live in our sin. I'm a big movie guy, and honestly, this reminds me of those spy movies where they die in the beginning, and then they come back, they wake up in a white room, it's always a white room, with people around them, and they talk about, they're like, yeah, you're dead to your family, you're dead to the world, you're dead to your boss, you're dead. And they give, they're given a new identity, like you're, they're told to move on and not go back to their past life. The same is with us. We are given a new identity, and we are told not to go to our past life. And so let's move on to Romans 6, verses 3 to 4. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so we can see Paul starts us off, or do you not know? So this should be something common to the believers, something that we should know. And so Paul also hits on baptism. So we know that there are different types of baptism. We know there's water baptism, which we do here at the church, if you're interested. Um, there is spiritual baptism or baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's also baptism in the suffering. But Paul is talking about baptism into Christ. And baptism in the Greek means to immerse or overwhelm something. And so when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are immersed or overwhelmed by Christ. And once we are over, immersed and overwhelmed by Christ, we are buried with Christ into death. But we aren't just buried with Christ into death. Like Christ, God raises us from the dead. So how can we come out the same? There's a um, quote that I like from David Guzik that says, you can't die and rise again without it changing your life. Yeah. Something has to change. And when coming into a relationship with Christ, something has to give. You can't stay the same. It's never going to be Christ. Christ isn't just going to be like, yeah, sure, you can bring that along with you. No, he, he's not going to allow you to bring the thing that he died with you for. And so it's like trying to jump into a pool and coming out dry. Try it, please. If it works, uh, but it's like trying to jump into a pool and coming out dry. It's impossible. It's not going to work. You are going to come out differently. So Christ didn't die for you or me to stay the same. And so we are called to walk in newness of life, not oldness of life. And so this is why water baptism is such a beautiful thing and why I love it so much because it's the phys- one, it, we are professing our faith in Christ, but two, it's a physical representation of what happens to us spiritually when we accept Christ into our life. We are buried with him, we die with him, and thankfully they bring us back up out of the water, and we are raised again to life with him. And so this is, this is why it's such a beautiful thing and it's a great reminder. I've been baptized three times. I was baptized when I was really young. I was baptized here at this church. And a couple months ago, I went to a Jesus rally and I was baptized again. Why did you get baptized a third time? I was in a place in my life where I needed to be reminded that I had died to my old life and that I was raised with Christ and I'm not the old person that I was. It's like when we take communion, the bread represents the body that Christ broke for us. The wine or the juice or whatever you drink represents the blood that he shed for us. And so moving on to Romans 6, verses 5 through 7. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. So after dying and rising with Christ, we are supposed to be living a resurrected life. And a resurrected life is full of 
freedom. So what are we going to choose to do with this freedom? Are we going to choose to go to the back to the things that were killing us, that were harming us? Or are we going to walk in newness of life to all the things that God has planned for us? And so we can see here that Paul talks about the old man. When I read this, I'm like, I'm a young, strapping 20-something. What is he talking about, old man? And so Paul is, ta- when ta- Paul is talking about the old man, the old man is the sinful nature that was inherited by Adam and is something we are born with. I'm sorry, no one here was born a Christian. And so this is the natural desire that's been ingrained in us to turn away from God, turn away from his word, and rebel against him and his commands. And so our old man has been crucified with Christ. It was never God's plan to rehabilitate or fix this old man, but to crucify him, to kill him, so that we can then inherit a new man that is just like Christ, that we may walk like him and look more like him. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Not some things, not one thing, not two things. All things have become new. And this is nothing that we do ourselves, but what God has done in us in place of that old man. God gives the believers a new man, I keep saying man a lot, new nature, I should say, that is no longer like Adam. And so, out with the old, in with the new. And so, Jesus didn't free us from sin to continue in sin. That means his death would have been for nothing, it would have been cruel, but he didn't, continue to, he didn't die for our sins for us to continue in sin. And so, when you live a life of sin, you become slave to it. And that's what Paul starts to get to, because he says that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And so, if you live a life of sin, you are then slave to it. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of Daniel lore, backstory. I used to be a stoner, a pothead. I used to smoke a lot of weed. And you could not, for the life of me, tell me that I was addicted, that I was a dependent. I I was not hearing it. I was like, no, I'm not. I can stop at any time. Famous last words. I could not stop at any time. I had to do it in the morning, before I went to sleep, before I went to work. Whatever it was, I was slave to it. I did not have control over it. It had control over me. And so there's a quote from this movie called Spartacus from the 1960s. And it says, death is the only freedom a slave knows. And so that is why we die with Christ. And so I'm going to move on to Romans 6, verses 8 through 10. It says, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So death no longer has dominion over Christ because he rose from the dead. He died once for all. He doesn't have to continue to die. He lived the life that we couldn't and died to death that we all should have. He was perfect in every single way. So there's only one death, one resurrection, but eternal victory and glory. And so Christ didn't go out to live for himself after he rose from the dead. He didn't say, Father, I did all you asked me to do. I'm just going to go see what this whole life thing is about. No, he lived a life to God. And so we are also called to live a life to God because he's freed us. And so Christ didn't die for me to live for me. But he died for me to live a life to God. 1 Peter verses 14 through 16 says, So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And so we are called not to slip back into our old ways to satisfy our old desires, because we didn't know any better then. The scriptures say, you know, when I was a child, I thought like a child. But as we are maturing and are matured in Christ, the choices we make knowing better have a bigger impact. I know that hurt me the most whenever I got in trouble, and my parents or my teachers were like, come on, Daniel, you know better. Like, like, that hurt the most, me knowing better and still choosing to do the thing I know I wasn't supposed to do. It hurt the most. And so... It also says we are called to be holy as he is holy. So what does it mean to be holy? So holy holy means to be sacred, morally blameless, 
consecrated or a saint, or if I can just sum all these together, set apart. And so this pursuit for holiness or to be set apart, it's not an easy one. I'm not going to say it's easy. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. It's not an easy one, especially if you try to do it in our own strength. That's why God in his perfect plan has given us the Holy Spirit. He is here to guide. He is here to lead. He's here to correct. He's here to convict us that we may walk in holiness and to be more and more like Christ, to look more and more like him. I don't know about you, but when the Holy Spirit's convicting me, he gets me in my gut. I may be going somewhere, may do something. He's like, oh, gosh, I just get a stomach ache. He's like, don't go there. Don't do that thing. It's because he loves us, and he wants us to not go back to the old things that were killing us, to gr- that grieve him, but to walk in all that he is calling us to do. We can't do that looking back. Try walking forward looking back. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's hard. It's difficult. And so, moving on to Romans 6, verses 11 through 12. It says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed, to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, I'm going to pause right there. Because we all know when we see therefore, we have to see what it is. Therefore. Okay, maybe not everyone knows. When you see therefore in the Bible, usually people say, see what it is there for. And so we're going to take a step back and talk about all that we've, I've gone over today. So we've talked about how we shouldn't sin to receive more of God's grace. How we've been baptized into Christ. How we died with him how we rose with him, how we live with him, and how we are called to walk in newness of life and how we are new creations. And we are called to live a life of God. We're all caught up? Verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey in its lusts. And so first and foremost, what are we called to do? We are called to recognize that we are indeed dead to sin. That sin no longer has reign, dominion, or power over us, or at least most of the time, the power that we choose to give it. And so living in sin, it should no, once again, should no longer be natural for us. We have no business living in sin. What does sin have to do with our life now as Christians? But if we continue to live a life of sin, of course we're going to be slaves to it. It says you're going to be slave to whatever you allow to reign in your mortal body. You're going to obey it. I know when I came to know Christ, I was still struggling with a lot. I was still living in habitual sin. I'm, I'm going I'm to be honest with you. And it's because I kept feeding it and feeding it and feeding it and feeding it. And it got to the point where, one, Christ was like, again, you know better. And then, two, I started to hate what it was doing between my relationship and between God. It was separating me from him. I would fall in sin. And I'd be like, man, I can't come to church. Everyone's going to know that I sinned. PA's going to be mad at me. Everyone knows, oh, my gosh, you know, God, I can't talk to you. I can't look at you. That's what sin does. It wants us to look away from God. God, I'm not worthy. You know, I, I don't deserve your love. I don't deserve your forgiveness. I don't deserve anything for you. But if you are dead to sin and alive in Christ, it, should, we should, it comes with this sense of freedom. Where it's like, okay, yeah, I'm dead to sin, alive in Christ. If I fall, God, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. I I, I know that I messed up, but I know that your love for me, that your grace for me exceeds my sin. It does not match it. And so I feel like a lot of times as Christians that we can, at least I knew for the longest time I was wearing phantom chains. I, I thought I was still bound. I thought I was still locked up. And the Lord was like, the cage is open. I've taken off the chains. Take them off. He says to walk in freedom, that we are no longer slaves. But these chains, these cages, they can become so comfortable because we lived in them for so long. But Christ is saying, come out. Come out. It is okay. You are no longer bound. But we are called to walk in freedom. And I know that you may be thinking, Daniel, that's way easier said than done. It's true. Yes, I know. I can say it. Die to sin. But it is possible. There are so many testimonies. There's so many testimonies. You can look up online, talk to people in the church. There are so many testimonies of people who are struggling in sin, living in sin, and God took them out. He freed them. He says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things, not all things, but, or all things except, all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because we are given a new strength, and it's not of ourselves. I can't tell you how many times I've tried to pull myself up by my bootstraps and walk out of sin. I kept falling. It was, and so Christ came in. He's like, Daniel, I got you. Let me help you out. It's by Christ's strength that I'm able to live, that I'm able to walk. 
And we live, a, we live and serve a God of the, of the impossible, of the unlikely. And so, of course, he's going to be able to help you in your time of need and distress. And so you may be thinking, okay, Daniel, once again, you can say all this. What do I do? I'm going to give you some practical ways, at least Paul will. And first and foremost, I want you to know that the same spirit that was in Christ is in you. Yeah. So that's first and foremost. Know that the Holy Spirit that was in Christ is in you, so you have the same power that he has. He has been, Holy Spirit is our helper. He's our comforter. He is here to help and guide us. Yeah. But what does Paul say? We'll look at Romans 6, 13. And I, I chose this specific version. Oh, wait, it's not there yet. Um, I chose this specific translation, NLT, because it, it leaves no room for, like, interpretation or, mis, like, under, mis, no, misunderstanding. Because I know I'm, I read and it, um, New King James Version. Mine says members, so I didn't want anyone to think, I'm not in a band, Daniel, what are you talking about, members? <laughs> and so I chose this version so everyone knows and we're all on the same page. It says, do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. So it says, do not let any part of your body, that's why I use this, any part of your body, your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your big toe, whatever it is, do not lose any part of your body as an instrument to serve sin. And so there are some ways that we can help ourselves to falling back into sin. Cut off your temptations. Yeah. If it's Instagram, YouTube, Hulu, um, Netflix, like whatever it is that is calling you to fall, a best friend, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, whatever it is that is calling you to fall into sin, cut them off. Yeah. And so we have to, and first, let me say this. We have to be careful to think that we died to temptation. We didn't die to temptation. This says we died to sin, not temptation. So we're still going to be tempted, but you can cut off the things that are tempting you. PA uses the example all the time. If I'm an alcoholic, why am I going to continue to walk into a bar? Like, I'm gonna, like, I know it's going to tempt me. And so falling into sin, it's not worth it. Let me just, it's not worth it. Matthew 5, 29 uh, through 32. I like this version too because it says, so if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your hand, even your good, oh, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And I'm going to give a little Daniel translation. If your friend, your best friend, causes you to sin, cut them off. If your boyfriend, girlfriend, amazing boyfriend or girlfriend, causes you to sin, cut them off. Because... I heard this quote that says, better to limp into heaven than to walk into hell. And so I don't know about you, I'd rather limp into heaven knowing I lost something and gained everything than to walk into hell knowing I gained nothing. And then people in this world are dancing their way into hell. It's so sad. I'm living my best life. I'm living my truth. I'm living for me. And they're dancing their way into hell. And I'm telling you right now, I'd rather crawl into heaven than walk my way into hell. So... Matthew 16, verses 24 to 25 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever, who, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit it a man if he gains the whole world and loses his whole soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? It's not, it's not worth it. I'm telling you, it's not worth it. There's a quote I heard that says, don't be entertained what Christ died for. You're, yeah, I know that hit hard. I was like, oh, my gosh, okay. <laughs> yeah, don't be entertained with what Christ, oh, don't be entertained by what Christ died for. And so, okay, Daniel, you told me that I'm not to let my body to be used as sin. What's the flip side? What did it say? What did, what did Paul Say, what does God's word say? Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. And so all members, all, all body parts, our whole body, is to now 
be presented to God for his righteousness. I know something that hit me hard is that I had to realize that it was no longer about me. It is no longer about me. I do not live for me anymore. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 through 15. Either way, Christ's love controls or compels us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we all have died to our old life. He died for everyone, that those who received his new life will no longer live for themselves. It's right there. Will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. And this is an everyday thing. Every single day. Romans 12 hits it where it says, present our bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. This is an everyday thing. And Peter hit it on earlier. This is not a Sunday thing. You don't just come on Sundays. Yep, okay, I'm living for God Sunday. Rest of the week is for me. No, it's an everyday thing. It's not, and so we no longer live for us, but we live for Christ. And Christ lived for others. Galatians 5, 13 through 14. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so not living for us, living for God, living for Christ means we live for others. We love others. And living for Christ, it reminded me in the Old um, Testament where they were sanctifying and dedicating priests. They would take the sacrificial blood, they put it on their their ear, they put it on their thumb, and they put it on their toe. And so they sanctified and showed that, or signified, not sanctified, signified and showed that these ears are from hearing from the Lord, the commands of the Lord. These hands are for serving the Lord. These feet are for walking wherever the Lord is sending me. But let me tell you something. You've been covered by the blood of Christ. And so your whole body is to now to be used to serve God in all that he is calling you to do. Galatians 5.1, for freedom, for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Do not go back. In your freedom, yes, you've been given freedom, you've been given, given free will, but do not use it to go back to what was harming you, to what was killing you, to what was separating you from God. Because Christ has more for you. He has so much more for you. We're talk- he has so much more for you, all than you can ask or imagine. And it's more than we can think of ourselves or for ourselves. And so we are his creation, not our own. So we're going to end off with Romans 6, 14, which says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace grace, this undeserved favor from the Lord. I mean, I can't tell you how much that wrecks me, that God looks down upon me and he's like, damn, I want to lavish my grace upon you because I love you, because you are mine, you've been adopted. It's for us. And so I have three points that I want to hit on today. Point one, because he died we die. How can we claim to want to live for Christ, be like Christ, and not do the things that he did? So because he died, we die. Point two, in all you do, live a life to God. In all that you do, it's to live a life for God. And number three, which I think is very important, appreciate God's grace. Don't He's giving it to you as a free gift. Don't abuse this gift that he's giving you to live the life you want to live or to live in the sin that pleases you or that you love so much. And so I'm going to tell you that you're going to sin. I'm going to steal your from PA. Daniel, be more positive. I'm positive you're going to sin. But sin will not have dominion or reign over you any longer. And God, who is rich in mercy and is faithful to forgive, he loves you. He wants relationship with you. And you can enter into relationship with him today. We can all stand. So if you are far from Christ, if 
you are living this life of sin, and I know I'm not calling anyone, but the Lord will show you if you're living a life of sin, and what that sin is, and whether you should be walking in it. Well, you shouldn't be walking in it, but that you shouldn't be walking in it, that he's calling you to relationship with him. And God's word says, if you profess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you shall be saved. And so Christ wants to free you today. If you want to be free, Christ is, his arms are open. Come, come, I want to free you. And so we can bow our heads and close our eyes. And if you want, you can repeat after me saying, Lord, I know that you died for me. I know you died to free me. I believe that you are my Lord and Savior. And I give my life to you. I thank you. And I love you. In Jesus' mighty name.